All right, so our next speaker is Steve Plimpton, and he is um, part of the Scalable Algorithms Group at Sandia National Laboratories. Um, in the past, he has been also been part of the Computational Biology and Parallel Computational Sciences Group at Sandia. So uh, I'd like to welcome him. Thank you. All right, so I want to tell you about uh, some stream, streaming algorithms we've been working on, uh, which are applied to large, sparse graphs, uh, where the graphs are big enough they don't fit in uh, memory, but the, the edges and vertices have to be distributed across uh, many processors. Uh, as part of that, I first want to tell you about a little framework uh, we've developed called FISH, which we found useful for kind of uh, exploring and developing uh, streaming algorithms with. So I don't think for this group I need to motivate uh, stream processing. I'm from San, uh, Sandia's New Mexico site, so I did want to show one picture of a typical desert uh, stream in New Mexico, which I'm sure is more green than uh, where you guys live. Uh, but I'll just make two points um, uh, about stream processing. One is we often think of it in the, in, in the context of being resource-constrained processing. So you have these datums arriving at a very high rate. Uh, as the previous speaker said, you can maybe only afford to look at them once. Certainly the amount of computation you can do on each datum has to be small so that it's uh, completed by the time the stream continues and the next datum arrives. Uh, also, we typically are doing processing that fits in memory, so you're storing state about the datums you've seen uh, recently that have to fit in that memory for fast access. And that means as you run continuously, you have to have some mechanism to age or expire data so you can keep up uh, with an infinite stream. We find a kind of pipeline uh, model attractive. It's kind of related to old data flow uh, ideas in uh, computing, where you define a, a series of compute kernels, which each do a little task, and then you hook them together in some interesting compu computing pattern, or I should say communication pattern, so that data flows between those little compute kernels. And so what that enables you to do in a, in a parallel sense is to uh, have a, a series of kernels that would sit on top of some shared memory layer. This is similar to what David uh, Bader talked about in the first talk, and you can get shared memory parallelism by having uh, those different processes store state or share state in that shared memory. What I'm going to be talking about, by contrast, is a way to split the stream into different forks uh, that are processed independently uh, in distributed memory, and then you can only sort of communicate state by having some kind of message uh, passing that goes between them. So, um, <coughs> There's at least a couple of uh, uh, products I know of that are out there, and I'm sure there's more that do this kind of data flow processing of streams. One, a commercial product uh, by IBM called Infosphere. Another by Nathan Mars, who's at uh, Twitter, uh, recently released called Storm. It's open source software for running a bunch of independent processes and flowing data between them. Our little model Fish is kind of conceptually uh, has some similarities to Storm, but it's a much simpler bare bones kind of model, not a full-featured product by any means, uh, but we call it FISH, which stands for Parallel Harness for Informatic Stream Hashing, and I'll talk about what hashing means in this context in a moment, but we really like the name because fish uh, swim in a stream, and as you'll see on the next slide, it gives us lots of fish metaphors that we can use to describe things. Um, we, to, uh, one interesting feature of the package is that uh, it's a little library that sits either on top of MPI or on top of sockets. So MPI is the message passing interface, which means you can run it on top of, or on really any uh, shared memory or distributed memory machine which supports MPI, which is basically all of them. And if you wanted to run on geographically dispersed machines, you could use sockets, and that's really supported by this underlying 0MQ library, which is a nice, uh, very nice open source uh, wrapper on sockets. Uh, so the basic idea of all these uh, frameworks, if you will, is again, that you have zillions of tiny messages that you're pathing around and shipping between independent processes that are doing small computations on them in a data flow sense. So here's some FISH features quickly. Uh, it's just a very small portable C library. The C interface means that you can write code uh, that links to it from C or C++ or Fortran or Python. Uh, we don't, unlike Twitter Storm, for example, we're not trying to support some big backend like a parallel distributed file system with data redundancy like the Hadoop file system. We're also not doing anything with fault tolerance, which we just blame on MPI since it doesn't support fault tolerance itself. Uh, so here's some of the fish lingo I promised. Um, we think of writing these little minnows, standalone applications that get linked to the library that do a specific computation. 
If you have a series of those for parallelism that are working on different parts of the stream, that's a school of minnows. Then you hook uh, the minnows together in different interesting communication patterns to flow your data through the, the collection of uh, computation and communication together as a fish net or a network uh, that performs a computation. And you can go to fish wrappers and fish tails. It's hard to stop once you start going down uh, that path. Okay, so here's an example of a fish net, and I'll, I'll couch this in the terms of doing a traditional MapReduce computation, which I'm sure uh, some people here are familiar with. So imagine that you've run a big uh, scientific simulation, of, in this case a particle simulation that's dumped out a bunch of snapshots. You want to do post-analysis on those snapshots to identify individual atoms that did interesting or particles that did interesting things during their trajectory. Maybe they came close to a protein binding site or transversed uh, uh, through a, a lipid bilayer multiple times through a channel or something like that. So you really need to reorganize your data from being snapshot based to particle based. So you can take all the individual coordinates of a particular particle and do some analysis on those. So MapReduce gives you a nice uh, framework for doing that. You'd have a bunch of mappers here, these little scatter programs. These would be the minnows in the fish context. So the green box is a school of minnows operating in parallel. So they each get some subset of snapshots to work on. They take the, the data in that and they convert it into a keys and values. So the key would be the ID of the particle and the value would be the timestamp and the X, Y, Z position of the particle. Those get moved around in a hash sense by assigning a subset of the atom IDs to each of the reduce minnows, the analyze program, if you will. So this sort of all to all of tiny little datums flowing back and forth happens between these two stages. And then for the atoms that it owns, uh, that analyzed minnow will have all the timestamps, all the coordinates of the entire direct trajectory. So it can sort those by timestamp and do this analysis. So really what this is enabling is, is what MapReduce does, which is converting data from one representation, representation to another. So in this case, from a per snapshot to a per particle representation, so you can do the analysis. So if you wanted to set this up and sort of run it on a big set of files in FISH, you would write a little script like this. There were really three little kinds of minnows uh, in that previous diagram. So there was the scatter one that does the map, the analyze one that does the reduce, and then something that does the statistics. Um, so you would specify those with little minnow commands in your input script with whatever arguments they need to run. Uh, then you'd hook them together so that the, the hook between the map and the reduce is this hash mechanism of passing, da passing data keyed on the atom uh, particles just a single connection from all the reducers to the statistics, and then you'd specify the size of the schools and how to invoke them. So maybe the last uh, minnow is really written in Python, so you can say invoke that under Python to run with the others. You run that little input script through another Python script, and that produces an MPI config file that can be launched with an MPI command or with a shell script if you're running on top of sockets that initiates all the processes and connects them by sockets. So if you wanted to do the same thing in a streaming context, you'd say essentially the same little network, but now you could hook it to a running simulation that's running on some other set of processors and producing these snapshots real time. And chunks of particles would go to each of these uh, little scatter minnows. They would do the same thing as before, spread them out to the analyze minnows. Now you might add a little trigger minnow, which the user could tap a key or do something to tell uh, the reduced minnows to print me out your current statistics about what the particles have done to this point. And those could be offload or channeled into this stats uh, minnow and it could produce, provide some feedback either to the user to alter what they would trigger next or the feedback might go all the way to the running simulation to change some parameters in that and do some computational steering. Uh, so if you think of this in a MapReduce context, we have the traditional one versus a streaming one. And what we're now doing is much more fine-grained. Instead of blocking up all your parallelism in the map and then doing big chunks of communication and then everything in the reduce, we're kind of doing all things simultaneously, and little fine-grained messages are passing back and forth between the mappers and reducers. Okay, so now let me talk quickly about three different graph algorithms that can be built on top of this same framework. So the first is triangle enumeration. David talked about what a triangle is in a graph. It's three vertices connected by three edges. It's useful in that clustering analytic that he talked about, as well as other things. So imagine now we have some either real-time source or an archival source, uh, like a file of, of edges in a graph that have been uh, abstracted out of your data. We're running it into a set of little minnows here, each of which I've called triangle. Each is going to work on a subset of the graph. So a triangle is going to store some subset of vertices and the edges associated with that vertex. 
So there's a hashing operation that happens here initially where an edge is, is coming in and it gets routed. Uh, say if it's VI, VJ, it gets to the owner, it uh, gets routed to the owner of uh, Vertex VI. We want to store, for reasons that will be clear in a moment, we want to store that, that edge only with VI or VJ, whichever of the two vertices is of lowest degree. So the way we do that is, is the first processor that owns VI tacks on the current degree of VI and then routes it back around in a loop to the same set of processors. So think of that as a hash connection coming out of here with the all-to-all -all that's routing datums back into the same set of minnows. Now it's the minnow that owns VJ. It looks at the degree and it either decides to store that edge if it's lower or passes it back to VI for it to store. When the uh, minnow stores the VI uh, vertex with a new edge, it takes the previous set of edges that are connected to that vertex and it emits what we call a wedge, uh, which is essentially an unclosed triangle. So it's a vertex at the apex with two new vertices but no third edge uh, on the wedge. And so that wedge goes, is sent to the owner of each of the open vertices, and if there is in fact a triangle that exists in the graph at that point, then one of those two uh, vertices will own the closing edge, and it can emit the triangle down here to the statistics. And so the trick we're exploiting here to, to only do things on the low degree vertex limits the number of wedges, the sort of explosion of information that might happen in the middle of this process. Uh, for many power law graphs, in the degree distribution, there's, there's uh, theory that shows for certain structures of those graphs you can sort of bound the work in this algorithm uh, to be proportional to the number of edges and so it completes nicely. We're also exploiting this idea of sort of looping information back around in a hash sense to itself to exploit parallelism at different levels. Okay, now let me talk about subgraph isomorphism as, a, as another interesting uh, data mining algorithm. So imagine you have a huge semantic graph uh, with colored vertices and edges which represent labels on information that's in your graph representation of your data. The subgraph isomorphism algorithm is to take a small target graph which has colors and labels and some little substructure and find all the occurrences of that in the big graph. So that's the subgraph isomorphism. Uh, what I'm going to show is building on a shared memory algorithm for doing this. It's now a distributed memory algorithm that can also be run in a, in a streaming sense that was originally developed uh, by John Barry and Todd Plantinga. The idea is that to find this little target graph here, which has five vertices and some edges, we're going to do as a pre-processing step to find a linear walk through those vertices and edges. That linear walk is laid out here with all the colors of the edges and vertices, and you can see sometimes we have to come back to the same vertex or edge twice. So that's represented with these flags here. The zeros are, are vertices we've never seen. When we come to a vertex like this blue one for the second time, we're indicating with the two that it really has to be the same vertex we saw in the second step and so forth on the fifth and third uh, vertices here. So with that linear walk, we build a little fishnet that looks a lot like the previous one for triangles, except now there's a little SGI minnow that's in the, in the middle of that school. And so as the graph is coming in, we're now going to store the edges twice, both on VI and VJ. And when we want to trigger a query for looking for a particular target graph, we give that little target graph and its linear walk to each of these processes and it takes the first vertex and the first edge in that walk, compares it for all the vertices it owns to see what are the matches and then emits that little one step walk in this looping fashion back uh, to, the to the owner of the vertex of VJ, the next one at the end of that edge. And so when a processor is receiving, receiving these edges streaming in, it's also receiving these little partial walks. When it gets to stage two, it looks at that vertex if it has a matching vertex of that color and edge of that color, it would add something to the walk and emit it around. Or if it was a constraint, it might delete the walk altogether because it didn't match a uh, previous vertex. And so in n iterations here, n being the number of steps through that little linear walk, we've generated the complete set of walks that match anything in that big graph and they can be admitted uh, to something that uh, generates the statistics. So the key idea here is by writing a little minnow it really is a fairly small amount of code. You just do that local operation searching on vertices and edges that it owns for matches and emitting the walk uh, one step at a time. You can actually string them together in this network to perform a distributed memory operation on a big graph in parallel. So the last algorithm I'll talk about just briefly is, is connected components, which David also talked about. The connected components are pieces of your graph which are connected within themselves through edges but totally disjoint from other parts of the graph. This algorithm has a little bit of different flavor than the two I just talked about. Imagine now we've got this continuous stream of edges coming in and we're going to let them fill up the memory with edges and vertices of one processor, which is also going to store 
uh, connected components as it finds them, but when that memory fills up, it's going to cascade over into a second processor and so on to a third through many processors. So we're going to sort of store this graph in a hierarchical sense, cascade it across many processors to increase the size of the graph. So at some point, this processor, which has components A and B with vertices and edges, an edge comes in that's it's overflowed its memory. It has to pass that on. So what it's going to do is, whoops, is convert, sorry, convert that edge into a different representation instead of V3 and V6. It's now just in component A with V6, and the second processor is going to store that connection. When an edge comes in that actually would connect these two components, this processor doesn't have room to store it. It's going to convert it to A and B. This processor will form it and connect those two and then form a new component C that's the union of those and so forth. When a third edge finally comes in and this processor is filled, it would have to be cascaded onto a third processor. So as I said, the storage here now, uh, edges are only stored once, vertices multiple times, but you can sort of store in aggregate the total size of a graph that would fit on all the processor's memories. And this, this model also enables real-time queries that can be embedded in the stream of edges. Ask things like which connected component a vertex is part of, or what is the neighborhood of a vertex, what's the statistics on all the small components. And uh, can't show you all the details, there's various complexities here I'm not going to talk about. But really, uh, the amount of computation and the data structures that are being used allow for order one <coughs> computation per edge that comes in and the queries to be answered exactly uh, at the point in time at which that query is in the graph as it exists. Then you can also do things like aging, where you timestamp the edges and jettison edges when you need to, uh, either from one processor to another or remove them from the graph altogether, which changes the structure of the components, obviously. So from a fish perspective, we just have a big ring of processors with edges coming in ahead and, and going around to a tail, and we have the ability to sort of permute uh, the order of that ring at times, which is necessary for some of these more complex operations. Okay, how am I doing on time for my 20 minutes? One minute. Okay, I'm just going to highlight quickly a couple of graphs of performance of fish running both on MPI versus on top of sockets, which again might be interesting to people interested in, uh, in doing message passing or doing streaming algorithms on distributed memory machines. So this is a so-called latency test. You're just taking two minnows and ping-ponging a message back and forth between them as fast as you can. That's something MPI is very well optimized for. So you get, this is on an InfiniBand cluster. You can uh, see a very small latency here of just a few microseconds, and FISH doesn't add very much to that. Sockets, by comparison, are not optimized for that kind of back and forth latency. Uh, so it's still pretty good, about 40 microseconds. The converse thing that, that sockets are pretty well optimized for is just one-way message passing. So you have a source and a sink, and you're shooting messages as fast as you can at a high rate between them, which is kind of like the way the fish networks work. So uh, fish here on top of MPI introduces a little more overhead, but MPI is also fairly good at best. Just between two processes, you can get on the order of 3 million messages a second that are zero length. Uh, the ZMQ uh, sockets are actually even better optimized for that by a little bit. Our FISH implementation isn't fully taking advantage of that, so that's something we still need to work on. And I'll just highlight, uh, let me just do one more graph here. This is the kind of hashed all-to-all -all where you can get some parallelism in the number of messages and datums you can shoot around a parallel machine. So this is taking a, a set of senders and a set of receivers and doing that little hashed all-to-all -all based on some key in the data type to, to send little messages between them. And as you add processors, more senders and receivers, and look at the total number of small messages uh, you can do, you can see here going up from just one sender and receiver to 16 of each, we go up about a factor of eight or nine in the millions of messages per second that you can get back and for, or get one way between the senders and the receivers. So that's uh, some nice parallelism, which uh, we're, we're going to experiment to see if we can go bigger, but it's, we're really using MPI in a way it wasn't designed for, which is sending lots of tiny messages. And usually in parallel computing, you try to do a few big messages uh, to get some parallelism out of your application. So that was my last slide. I'll just mention uh, places you can look for this software aside from FISH. We also uh, have a little package that does MapReduce on top of MPI, which you can look at if you're interested. These are folks I've worked with both on the graph algorithms and the software. And here's some papers that are either out or coming out that you can ask me about. Uh, so I think that's a good place to stop. Thanks.
in your in one of the first uh, examples that you illustrated in the, in the manual description, as as the intermediate stages begin to generate more data, uh -huh. um, assuming that this is actually streaming, not that you're reading it, yep. so that the nodes can full, full control the rate. Um, how do you ensure that the, the increase in, in data rate that's flowing internally doesn't saturate out yep. your ability to intake the actual raw data? That's a great question. So yeah, you're. You, you're right. The first two algorithms I showed, the triangle enumeration and the subgraph isomorphism, depending on what you're matching and the structure of the graph, you can, you can obviously you know, increase by a very large amount the amount of data that's there. So I don't, I guess in a, in a computer science sense, I don't think of those as streaming algorithms. We should probably call them more real-time algorithms, and you're right. You might generate so much data that you have to drop edges coming in or something like that. The third algorithm, the connected components, actually is a true streaming algorithm. They're sort of mathematical proofs that the, the amount of computation is bounded and you can sort of interleave for a stream of a certain rate some extra work and messages in between that do satisfy what you talked about. So in that case, we don't drop edges, but you could with the other. It seems like uh, the graph algorithms that you showed have the problem of hitting expander nodes, um, which have an extreme number of positive edges. Uh -huh. So um, you would uh, essentially be bottlenecked on processing those nodes in each of them. Yep. So the, so the triangle enumeration one, that, that little idea I talked about, about only storing the edge on the low degree vertex, I assume what you're calling an expander node is a high degree vertex, say, in a, in a, in a large sparse graph. It, it gets around that to some extent, that uh, the, the number of wedges you emit and the number uh, that you find is because it's on the low degree is more limited than if you did it on the high degree. But for the, sub or for the subgraph isomorphism, you could still have some really good expander nodes, you're right, which would generate a huge slew of walks out of them if you're, you know, you can, you can certainly ask a subgraph question that would generate a bazillion matches within a big graph. So, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna keep up with that in a streaming sense unless you ask something that has relatively few matches in the big graph. If I write a MapReduce job that uh, executes Sending most of the network, or most of the uh, graph across the network in each MapReduce iteration. How does the MapReduce and MDI uh, handle that? Um, the so problem? yeah, so it, it, I mean, it, there is the same issue. I mean, that's really a, a property of the MapReduce algorithm itself, rather than the framework. So what Hadoop would call the shuffle in between, where you've done a map, created some large intermediate data set, which in the triangle case might be all the wedges, for example, that then have to be moved around to the reduce stage. Uh, in the MapReduce MPI, it's a similar thing, but you're, you're uh, you know, storing to out of core files and doing essentially an all to all on big chunks of data. So a, a parallel machine that has a pretty good bisection bandwidth does pretty well at that operation. I mean, again, it's not something MPI is sort of designed for, but it can send huge chunks of data between all the processors pretty efficiently. So it does, it does pretty well. Great, thank our speaker.